Thank you for joining us today for a lively discussion about designing a sanctions compliance program that ensures sanctions risk is appropriately managed. Our speaker today is Camilla Yelitz from LexisNexis Risk Solutions. Camilla is a certified anti-money laundering specialist at LexisNexis Risk Solutions. She's well-versed in Office of Foreign Assets Control or OFAC sanctions compliance and related financial crime compliance regulations. Today, Camilla's focus will be on how corporations and financial institutions should heed the five essential components of compliance, as outlined in OFAC's publication, A Framework for OFAC's Compliance Commitments. Before we begin, a few housekeeping details. All registrants will get a copy of today's presentation. Please submit questions through the Ask a Question interface. Camilla will do her best to answer all questions, but will answer them after the event if we run out of time or a fuller answer is needed. The audio will come from your computer. There is no dial-in number. Please control the volume right there on your computer's toolbar. And, oh yes, even we have a survey. Please answer the survey questions in the window on the bottom left of your screen. You can answer those survey questions anytime during the webcast. And now over to you, Camilla. Welcome. Thank you so much, Mary, um, and thank you everyone for joining today. I think we're going to do a couple of poll questions first, Mary. That's I don't right, know and if... I'm, I uh, just wanted yeah, to say no, hello, fine. but let's do go ahead and take a look at the poll. We're asking you what kind of institution you represent. Do you represent a non-bank, a private company, business, law firm, etc.? If so, click your answer right there on the slide itself, and after you've done that, hit the Submit button. The other choices are non-bank, but a different kind, a money service business, a casino, non-bank financial institution. The third one is the bank. Are you a third party? So an audit or due diligence company. And um, we also have room for other. So if you're none of, the, none of those that you see right there, uh, go ahead and indicate that as well. So once again, choose your answer to this question. And um, uh, after you've chosen the answer, do go ahead and hit submit at the bottom of the screen. And we want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to weigh in on this question. So we'll give you a couple more seconds. The question again is, tell us the kind of institution that you represent. Bank, non-bank, in terms of being a money service business, casino or non-bank financial institution, or are you a private company, business, law firm, etc., some sort of third party? meaning an audit or due diligence company, or something entirely different. Hit your choice right there on the slide itself, and then push the Submit button. And Camilla, I think that it's a good idea right now to go ahead and take a look and see how our respondents answered. And uh, whoops, I've got to make sure yeah, that I'm the one that moves that, so <laughs> we're right. all in sync. Here it is. It looks like um, 40, you know, almost half are, are with a bank. Um, any reaction to that? Are you surprised at who's here? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's really interesting, and I'm glad um, we've got a lot of um, people on from our banks. Um, I think a lot of this is really going to be um, helping you understand what you're doing today, um, other ways in which we can enhance that, and how that relates specific to my bank friends on the phone, how that relates to you know, requirements that you're already doing. So this is going to be good. Um, definitely for my non-bank people, I think this is uh, really going to be helpful for you um, understanding how um, OFAC sanctions compliance is really going to fit into your organization. Um, so I'm excited for you all to be on. All right, thank you. We can move on. Okay, great. Well, like I said, everyone, thank you so much, uh, Mary, for the introduction. Thank you to everyone for joining today from wherever you are um, around the globe. Um, and thank you for your time. And I'm looking forward to presenting today and digging in um, to OFAC sanctions compliance program. <clears throat> okay. So let's get started. So most of you are probably aware, hopefully all of you are aware, um, May this year and for the first time ever, um, U.S. Office of Foreign Assets Control or OFAC 
um, issued guidance that outlined expectations for managing and having a sanctions compliance program. And if you haven't already, I really encourage every one of you to read um, that guidance in detail. Um, it's about 12 pages long, and the information it contains is essentially, you know, really a blueprint for you to use in creating or enhancing um, your sanctions compliance program. Um, and that's especially important um, and relevant for those of you on the call today who work for U.S. subsidiaries. Multiple OFAC violations uh, were issued this year um, related to um, violations identified within U.S. subsidiaries, their operations, um, their day-to-day -day, um, activity and their management. So definitely take that in and, and read that guidance. So it's been about seven months, uh, give or take. I think we've got about 20 days um, until Christmas. Um, so um, we want today to really dig in and take time to look at those components or those pillars of guidance um, that OFAC has um, issued and how you can interpret and execute on them. Um, most importantly, why you should as well. Okay, so before we dig into the guidance, I want to first look at the similarities between OFAC's guidance um, to what currently financial institutions and our friends and in financial institutions on the call today have been required to do for some time. There's definitely a lot of crossover between existing specific financial institution requirements and the guidance that OFAC published. And um, in a little bit, we'll, we'll discuss guidance that was also updated from Department of Justice that occurred in April of this year um, that's very similar um, to what we see within OFAC as well. And so for those of you not in the bank community or haven't sat within the bank community or the credit union community, um, there's always been requirements established in regards to managing and man maintaining an effective AML, BSA, um, OFAC program. And part of that framework has included five pi pillars, which you can see on the left-hand side of this, um, of this slide. A system of internal controls, independent testing, you know, having that designated compliance officer or somebody responsible for day-to-day -day compliance, you know, obviously appropriate training for appropriate personnel. And then recently, um, the fifth pillar, appropriate risk-based procedures for conducting ongoing customer due diligence. So, so the, the, that program, a bank's program, is really enterprise-wide, right? It's, it's overarching into everything, whereas on the right-hand side, you'll see for OFAC sanctions compliance, while it's taking most of those same um, theories or, or tenants of a program, they're also adding in risk assessment. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later because the risk assessment is really an important part of your program. So we can see that we can see the similarities, but you know, I think what I find very interesting is that OFAC's guidance is still a recommendation. Um, the bank requirements are exactly that, their requirements. And as you navigate through this process, especially for you um, guys that are in that non-bank world, um, as you go through the process of you know, creating and designing and enhancing your program, you might hear language you know, along the lines of, you know, well, it's not required, or I'm not a bank, I don't need to do this. And while technically that might be right, you know, there's a, this sort of um, understanding of expectation versus requirement. And in this current climate, it's really one of the same. Um, and we'll discuss it later as we, we go with, dig into a couple of the fines and penalties that were issued this year. But, you know, this lack of a, having a, a sanctions compliance program or a disregard for the guidance is going to be costly. So the effort you put forward today to document and outline that program will go a long way in reducing chances of, the, of monetary penalties um, and probably 
you know, what most people may think is worse is reputational risk exposure. Um, so, and in fact, actually, OFAC calls that out at the very beginning of the guidance, talking about you know, strongly encouraging organizations subject to jurisdiction to employ you know, a risk-based approach um, to having a sanctions compliance program. And, and strongly encourages, you know, really should be read here, as if you don't have this, then there's going to be no forgiveness for sanctions violations identified at a later date. Okay, so let's dig in to these um, five um, components or pillars of a sanctions compliance program. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of time going over these five pillars. Um, I'm going to keep my eye on the time, um, but um, I think this is really important to sort of dig in and see what we can learn from our, our friends and banks today. Um, they've already done this. Um, and how we can really enhance that process. <clears throat> um, okay, so management commitment, the first pillar or the first component. Um, I want to take time to dig into this one as well. OFAC actually calls out in the guidance that management commitment is, cri is a critical, critical factor in determining the success of your sanctions compliance program. Um, and again, expectations from OFAC around this, um, this component mimic what banks have been doing for some time. Um, OFAC identifies in the guidance the need for review and approval by senior management of your program and the appointment of a dedicated sanctions compliance officer. So these are things that should, hopefully, already be um, done by uh, financial institutions. But again, um, for the banks and the credit unions on the phone, ensure that you're really delineating that responsibility around your sanctions compliance program. Um, OFAC also goes on to identify the need for sufficient resources. So, you know, this is sort of that old age question, you know, do you have enough people to execute your program? You know, what happens if someone is sick? What's your plan for, you know, business continuity? How do you, you know, how are you going to manage um, those day-to-day -day processes continue appropriately? <clears throat> so, so the detail within this component from OFAC's guidance really highlights um, that trend towards building a culture of compliance and I know we've heard that for a long time now um, but for organizations that historically have struggled with this or or this is a new area of education um, then sometimes this can be your biggest hurdle for your your management or your senior management or board of directors <clears throat> and and remember you've got to take this in um, from you know, the lens of being a compliance group, you're going to be considered a cost center. So ensuring appropriate resources is often a hard sell. You know, how do you manage the message of the cost of non-compliance? So, so what ways can we deliver or can we help you deliver the importance of OFAC guidance and, you know, really ensure that management, um, you have your management buy-in? I'm going to discuss training. You can see that's part of a, a, a program element that should be included for management commitment. I'm going to talk about training a little bit further down. You know, education for senior management is really key to helping them understand the seriousness of your role as a compliance group within your organization. And, and, and as we know, you know, the sanctions landscape today is tricky to navigate and specific management training is really key to helping them understand, um, you know, that landscape today and having their buy-in. But what's something I wanted to focus on here, another way to gain management commitment <clears throat> is by providing them relevant metrics around your sanctions compliance uh, sanctions compliance processes and that's going to enable them to really understand what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis understand where the risk lies within your organization and as such you'll empower them to appropriately support you um, in your program efforts 
So here, this is just an example put together. Um, you know, you could, on a monthly basis, create simple reports that highlight sanctions metrics. So this enables your management to be aware of those risks. And it, right, it's reporting. Um, it's not like we don't do this enough of it, uh, enough of this already, um, but this is really going to help deliver that message. <clears throat> okay, so if we look at this slide, some options uh, around reporting. Identifying factors um, such as records um, screened versus the number of alerts generated. Um, this is going to give you, insight, you yourselves insight as well as management insight into the amount of effort um, that you're having to take on a daily basis to review those alerts. You know, how many were identified as a true match? Um, you can see what we've, you know, listed here, just giving you some examples for um, reporting metrics. Um, and ask yourself, how does this break out across all of your processes, all of those sanction screening processes within your organization, you know, onboarding versus ongoing, you know, really develop reporting that makes sense for your organization, um, but try to focus on key metrics that relate to um, productivity, sanctions risk exposure, and platform performance. <clears throat> I think it's a great idea um, if anyone is who's listening in is a designated um, OFAC officer. You may not, but I think it's a great idea to have your OFAC officer, that designated person, review and sign these reports um, You know, as an acknowledgement. That goes a long way to strengthening that program. Um, and have these reports added um, to management, um, management meeting minutes. Um, have those minutes, um, you know, document that your senior management or that compliance committee has, has reviewed and ingested um, these reports. So here, just a, a sample report and just to sort of really drive this last point home, you know, I, I think it's important to remember you don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? We, I think from looking at who's joined today, we really have a, a sort of a, a wide range um, of organizations on the call. Um, big institutions, big or complex organizations are going to have more resources. They're going to have more technology. For those of you that are smaller um, businesses and companies or smaller credit unions and, and banks, you don't need to have all of that power that the bigger organizations do. You know, Excel spreadsheets work fine. Um, reach out to your vendors, work with your vendors, you know, who provide or, or those sanction screening platforms that you're using and work with them to see how they can help. Um, you know, and the goal of this message here is that reporting should be able to make management aware of that day-to-day -day operations that you're doing, but also support any future um, compliance program enhancements, you know, addition of um, uh, additional um, employees or resources, you know, changes to watch the screening platforms, um, <clears throat> because these reports are supporting that information. Those metrics are supporting that information. Um, the point, listen, the point here being um, reporting um, around um, for your management teams, you know, can really be powerful tools to support your program and to drive that management um, commitment. Okay. Okay, moving on. Second component or second pillar here, um, the risk assessment. Um, for those of you that really haven't um, been a part of a risk assessment process before, um, consider yourselves lucky. Um, <laughs> these can really be a bit of a beast. Um, but you should take this opportunity to look at the risk assessment as a living document that identifies sanctions risk within your business operations and how you manage that risk. So OFAC states within their guidance that they recommend organizations take a, a risk-based approach when designing your program. Um, and that risk-based approach is actually driven by your risk assessment. 
So the risk assessment is going to help support your program, your sanctions program, in its underlying policies and procedures, controls, training, all of those aspects of the program. And it should be designed to manage the risks that you've identified within your organization. So this could be something as simple as, you know, I have a um, vendor management group. Um, they, they're separated into domestically within the U.S. and then internationally outside of the U.S. Could be expected um, and assumed that that vendor group that has that international area, that's probably going to have higher risk. So you're going to want to ensure those controls um, and that program is really supporting that higher risk group. Um, OFAC talks a little bit about the frequency in which you should do that risk assessment. Um, you know, it's really, it, it states it's meant to be suitable for your organization. I think generally um, industry-wide, we see that this as an annual effort. Um, at a minimum, it should be seen as, as certainly as an annual effort um, and certainly across the enterprise. Um, however, um, single moments in time or certain activities, um, mergers and acquisitions can also be a moment in which you need to you know, go back to your risk assessment um, and uh, document uh, that new addition. And in fact, OFAC really calls out M&A activity as an area that certainly presented numerous challenges in regards to adhering um, to OFAC compliance. Um, and we've seen this year where uh, many U.S. companies have acquired companies or partners outside of the U.S. Not enough due diligence has been done um, and business operations have continued in direct violation of you know, OFAC goals. Um, and, and programs. So M&A activity, definitely an area of focus and concern for OFAC um, and likely to be one that's going to be unfor unforgivable um, in regards to violations, OFAC violations. Okay, so how do we conduct an OFAC risk assessment? You know, how do we identify this risk? Where, you know, when do we um, assess sanctions risk or OFAC risk? Well, there's definitely a lot of great resources out there to help you in creating your framework um, for a risk assessment. Definitely get out there on Google and um, speak to, you know, any um, bank partners that you may have, um, you know, do your research. But really to simplify it in the time we have today, the risk assessment is really going to look um, at addressing risk across all of the groups or divisions or units within your organization, each part of the process they operate in, so are they onboarding versus ongoing, and how they relate to these areas under the program elements on our slide, um, in, you know, customers, products and services, geography, uh, and the type of transactions they're doing. You know, and, and again, there are multiple tools out there for you to utilize, you know, both ones that you've seen um, free from, you know, OFAC or, um, you know, other, other sources that you have access to, as well as obviously you can reach out to third parties and, and vendors. Um, but again, dependent on your organization, on its size and its complexity, you know, it could be something as simple as a Word document with Excel spreadsheets to support. Um, so it's really designed around specific to your organizational risk um, and to its size and to its complexity. Essentially, for each of those sections, for each of those you know, business units within your organization, you'll, you'll want to identify the inherent risk, the risk that exists um, regardless of controls, the controls that you have in place, and we're going we're gonna to talk about those, um, and then finally that residual risk. What's, combining that inherent risk and those controls, what do you have left over? Something really important to call out here. Don't be afraid to document um, areas that need improvement or areas identified as having an issue. And in fact, OFAC actually talks about that in the guidance as well. 
um, you know, stating, um, you know, utilize the risk assessment for identification of issues. Um, don't forget, risk assessments should be shared and delivered to your um, stakeholders, um, so those business units, and especially with management. Um, the risk assessment it goes a long way in, in, you know, educating your management and getting their support within your sanctions compliance program. Okay, doing for time. I think I'm okay, so we're going to carry on. Okay, so. Um, third pillar, third component here, internal controls. So <clears throat> I think we'll probably start to see a lot of these components crossing over. Um, you know, they're not independent of each other. Um, and we see that especially with internal controls. Controls sit across almost every component of every program out there. Um, and as we just discussed, um, within your risk assessment, there'll be a section or area that you'll want to document around internal controls, right? Um, in that risk assessment, you'll document the controls your business units have in place. What OFAC is talking about here is about actually establishing those controls in the first place. And, and don't fall into the trap of thinking these are just, you know, hey, I, I wrote some procedures or hey, I have a, a platform that screens, um, you know, my customers. It's a lot more than that. Controls are really a combination of factors which need to be considered all together. Um, so, for example, here under platforms and software, within the guidance, OFAC calls out the need to be able to respond rapidly to changes published by OFAC, right? They update the watch list. We never know when that's going to happen. So how does your watch list screening provider ensure those watch lists are updated and how are you managing that as well? What controls do you have in place to make sure that your software um, is being, that those watch lists are being updated? You know, just think about things, what can be automated versus what's being done manually? Um, especially for those of you on the phone, um, if any, who are manually uploading OFAC watch lists or those that have their platform, you know, say behind your own firewall, so you're actually having watch list information pushed to you or you're pulling it down from a location, then really ensure those procedures or that control around managing watch list updates has some additional steps, you know, a dual review process, for example. Um, something as well um, under internal controls that OFAC calls out, identifying and reporting escalation chains. Um, what does this mean? So um, as you're creating a procedure, right, to um, screen um, new vendors or new third party or new agents um, as they're being onboarded, um, what happens if you have a match to a OFAC watch list. So really what um, OFAC is saying here, make sure you're not just saying, yep, we screen them and this is how we do it. Make sure your procedures are including those alert reviews or adjudication um, notes so that you can actually review those, those messages or review those alerts that are being generated. Secondly, escalation. Um, have you established a process for escalation, right? Once you've identified that you have a, a, an alert, you've reviewed it, and then you've said, yep, this is a true match. Um, I'm going to have to block or reject this transaction um, or, or this, this payment that's occurred. Once you've done that, you've got 10 days to report to OFAC. Um, so you've got to identify in your procedure that you're adhering to that record keeping requirement. Um, as well as delineating who's doing all of that reporting and ensure management um, is notified as well. And I, you know, I think really the point here and what I'm trying to highlight and I, and I think what OFAC is highlighting is that it's more than just screening your customers or vendors, right? It's what you do when you have an alert or a match to an OFAC watch list. Um, and um, OFAC states in the guidance as well that the procedures, uh, I'm using an example here for a procedure, but you know those, 
those procedures should be relevant to the organization, capture your daily operations, most importantly, easy to follow. Um, I always think it's a good gauge that your procedures um, are written in a way that somebody without any knowledge of the process could actually execute that procedure. And again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, OFAC does provide on its website guidance and steps on reviewing a match um, or, a, or an alert. Okay, last thing I want to just call out here, this was important, um, I think, to mention from the guidance. Um, OFAC states within that guidance, procedures should be written in a way that is designed to prevent employees engaging in misconduct. Um, so I think we saw some of that um, in regards to um, some of the fines and penalties that were issued this year, where there was just really a blatant disregard for um, OFAC sanctions programs uh, and the requirements. Um, so, you know, how you can interpret this and, and employ this within your organization, you know, consider for your riskier workflows and processes, like dual review, pro, uh, dual review processes. Um, you know, the ability to be able to ensure that whoever is making that initial review, there's a second person that has a second set of eyes on it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about having um, quality assurance or quality control procedures in place um, next under testing and auditing, but this is really a good internal control as well to help you support, um, well, if you establish a QC process, and let's say, for example, around alert review and adjudication of that alert, then having a QC process around that acts as an internal control to not only help you identify employees who need additional training, right, but also ones that might be engaging in, in misconduct. So certainly talk a little bit more about that now, but that's a good way to be able to satisfy that aspect um, of OFAC's guidance. Okay, so, so I think flowing in nicely here into testing and auditing um, the fourth component or pillar of the sanctions compliance program. Um, I think it's good advice. Um, consider your internal audit team as a partner, right, when managing and enhancing your program. You definitely meet with them regularly if you can, um, and definitely bring items to their attention first. You know, it's, it, it, it really works better if you um, identify an issue first, bring it to audit along with a plan to fix it versus ignoring an issue and then hoping audit doesn't find it because they, um, many times they always will. Um, OFAC calls out in the guidance, you know, the goal of an audit for them is to attest the effectiveness of your sanctions compliance program. Again, um, industry-wide, industry that's really the interpretation. Um, but it's really about ensuring that your organization has the ability to identify program weaknesses um, and any deficiencies. And this is your, and this is clearly marked within the guidance. This is your responsibility to ensure that the program is being enhanced um, as needed. Um, so when we talk about that in relation to auditing, in relation to testing, identifying issues, and then uh, enhancing the program as needed, this could be things like updating screening software um, or other technology. Um, because, say, perhaps you have too many false positives that are being generated. That impacts operational day-to-day -day businesses or day-to-day um, -day, um, operations, and therefore you're not executing on appropriate um, alert review um, procedures or the time in which to do that. Um, any order of your, your program should always be conveyed to stakeholders. Um, you know, especially management. Um, OFAC highlights this again within their guidance, identification of enhancements to the, to the program through an audit can be used um, to help support the request for more resources 
such as people and platforms. So that's definitely something, again, another tenant, another element or a tool um, to be able to support your communication with management and get those appropriate resources and support. Okay, obviously audit needs to be independent. Um, you know, that's probably um, pretty key. But you can do your own steps to manage your program. You know, looking at it around from a testing perspective, um, you know, you want your audit probably to be annual um, at minimum and to be completed by that independent group. Um, and as note here, if you don't have an internal audit team, or you do, but they really need support in conducting a true sanctions compliance audit, this is you know, perhaps their first time digging into that, then certainly a factor to consider um, and something that you can communicate to management is having a third party support you within that first true audit of your program. Um, that's going to allow you to be able to say, okay, we need um, you know, financial resources here or to build your budget to incorporate that. Um, and you can also sell it to management in a way, you know, saying, listen, we've got outside support we're going to pay for for the first year. Um, but we're going to leverage that framework and what we're learning, not only for my compliance teams, but for the audit teams, so that they can continue that process on an ongoing basis for much less cost. And again, that's going to give you really that framework that's appropriate and that's expected within the industry. Um, don't forget an audit or testing can be completed on a specific process. Um, or area as well as like, um, you know, at the organizational level, the enterprise level, you know, especially if you're doing M&A activity, make sure you're um, instituting um, an audit at that moment as well to make sure that you're um, ensuring proper control. I like to think of it as the three P's at the bottom um, of this slide here, people, practices, and platforms. Um, do I have the right people? Do I have my processes documented? And do my platforms work? <clears throat> That's essentially the questions your audit should be asking and a way in which to support that is to have your own quality control or QC program in place. And so that's what we want to talk about here. Um, I'm going to move along a little bit because I realize I'm um, um, over the halfway mark. So your QC program here, this is really about supporting that internal audit process. Um, and you really want to make sure, again, that you're identifying those issues first and then bringing it to audit's attention. Um, think about um, from a, a common QC um, element or, or QC program element that we see um, is doing your own review of alerts. Um, that have already been adjudicated, right? So have someone review a sample of alerts, and make sure that those um, they're reviewing to for accuracy and completeness of that alert, um, and that the language that's been used has been correct. And then you can utilize, start to see where this is crossing over, I hope. You can start to use this within training of employees, um, which we're going to come to next but also as a, a key element in identifying any misconduct um, within, within those employees. And again, it doesn't have to be complex. You can use this within, you know, really just any um, Excel spreadsheet. <clears throat> okay, I'll try to get through training in the next couple of minutes here. Um, <clears throat> so the, the final pillar or the final component um, and again, I think management commitment and training, these are probably the most important aspects of your sanction compliance program. Um, and we know going back to management commitment at the beginning that it's integral for them to understand the risk that your, your organization is exposed to from a sanctions perspective. Um, but you want to think about building that training out specific to that audience. Um, you know, you want to think about um, making sure that that training is specific to the role 
and targeted to the role. Uh, think about breaking it out into groups, right? So I've got training for my, my board um, and perhaps management, senior management as two different groups if you have a board of directors for those of you on the call. Um, think about training specific to all employees, right? We, my HR person doesn't necessarily need the same training as my, you know, um, level two analyst. Um, and then, of course, think about training specific to those compliance sanctions AML groups. And from a frequency, those should all be on a different cadence. You want to look at it at least annually uh, at a minimum. And in fact, OFAC calls that out in the guidance. Um, but you'll want to think, you know, probably for your sanctions teams and your compliance teams, having that a lot more regularly um, and, and, and engaging with, you know, outside parties, inviting somebody from, you know, ICE to come in and talk to your team or whoever it may, whoever it may be. Um, last couple of things on this one as well. Um, consider um, how you're going to train new hires versus that ongoing training. Um, oftentimes, transferees within your organization can get lost in the shuffle. Treat them as a new hire, right? If you're hiring on somebody that's already in the organization but into your compliance group, treat them as a new hire. Make sure they're getting the right training. Um, and also make sure your training, I, I put this in as theory and practice, right? But um, we want to make sure that we're training both on current um, sanctions knowledge, what's occurring in the industry today, what's occurring out there um, in the sanctions world, as well as specific to your organization and their systems um, and controls. And again, don't reinvent the wheel. Think of um, using a vendor. Um, you know, if you already have a training team, um, utilize them, work with them to say, this is how I want to build my program. Um, having um, a, a training platform in place is crucial because it's going to help you track all of that training that's being done across those different um, groups within your organization. And finally, consider um, how you're going to um, deal with people who don't take training. What are the ramifications if I don't complete my essential compliance training um, uh, on time? Um, and you should hold a management accountable at that same level as well. This is not a check the box exercise for them to be able to really um, support you within your sanctions c compliance program. You've got to hold them accountable to doing training and completing it on time. Um, and, I, and again, that can sometimes be a complete um, culture shift. Okay, Mary, I think we have another poll here. That's right. You can take a slight rest here. Here's a poll question. All you have to do is answer yes, no, or not sure. To the question, do you have an oversight into creating and designing your OFAC sanctions compliance program. And um, just click your answer right there on the slide itself. And once you've done that, hit the submit button. I did want to mention a lot of people are asking whether or not they'll get a copy of today's presentation and the slides themselves. And yes, all registrants will get a copy of today's presentation. You'll get a notification via email after today's event. So once again, choose between yes, no, and not sure. Camilla, I notice it's not all of the above as a choice here. But once you've chosen the answer to do you have an oversight into creating and designing your OFAC sanctions compliance program, you just hit submit, and we'll go ahead and uh, take a look at everybody's answers. So just one more second before people um, get to see whether or not people have that oversight. And by the way, don't forget you can ask a question in the Ask a Question interface. We've gotten lots of questions, and we're really going to be happy to take those questions as soon as uh, Camilla has finished her presentation. And let's now do take a look at uh, how people have answered the question. Do you have an oversight? And, uh, well, over half do. What do you think, Camilla? Um, that's awesome. I'm, I'm really pleased, and I hope for those of you that have that oversight, I'm hoping this has been helpful. 
um, to be able to really dig in, you know, again, see where that lies in relation to what financial institutions are doing in the course of here in the bank. This hopefully um, should be um, not terribly um, new information for you. Okay, Mary, I know we are only have about 15 minutes left. Uh, left, so I, uh, I sh we shall move along here. Um, <clears throat> these next couple of slides just should hopefully only take about five minutes. Um, I'm not going to labor this point. Just note that within OFAC's guidance that they issue, um, they list um, very nicely for us um, all of the um, areas in which they've really seen the failures within an organization's program or lack of a program. Um, and so this is a really interesting read at the end. It's only, again, only a couple of pages within the guidance, um, but it really pulls out um, important information and something to consider as you're designing your program there. Okay. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the examples of where things went wrong from existing or fines and penalties that were issued this year. Um, before I do that, something to call out, um, and this is probably most relevant for um, my um, corporates or companies on the call today, um, the um, issuance or the enhancement of the Department of Justice guidance that was actually issued a couple of days before OFAX was um, in April of this year. Um, and, you know, what they're talking about here is really in relation to a corporate compliance program. Um, they identify three overarching questions um, about your program um, and how it should be designed um, and how it should be managed. And this is the exciting part of the presentation, everyone. Thank you for hopefully you're all still here. What I really wanted to call out, though, was um, using the magic of PowerPoint animation, um, we start to see that consistency um, within um, what we saw within OFAX guidance as well as what we saw um, or no within bank guidance as well or bank requirements. So we really start, start to see that consistency there. Um, okay, so let's dig into some of the, the, the trends with fines and penalties that we saw this year. Um, it's certainly been an interesting year um, in regards to um, of where those fines and penalties had been um, or who have been administered against. Um, we've already seen in 2019, I think the majority of the fines and penalties were related to U.S. businesses and subsidiaries of foreign companies operating in or within the U.S. Um, this is a departure, right? I mean, probably last couple of years it's really been fines and penalties against banks um, and financial institutions. Um, now we're seeing the shift towards really targeting um, that non-bank community, right? Um, looking at those companies and organizations um, that are so deeply embedded within U.S. trade. Um, certainly something to note, um, there's been a couple of articles around this as well, which has been interesting. Um, but the current administration really has been moving at an unprecedented rate of increasing sanctions um, across the board from a, a jurisdictional perspective as well as at an entity level. Uh, we saw it with Iran. We've seen it with Cuba. Um, and this is really um, a big shift. Um, a counter move um, to the prior administration. So it's definitely my non-banks start to consider that for everybody. Um, think about that um, as you're operating today. Um, very quickly on this, this is the matrix um, that and we've provided the source on the slide and you'll get all the slides. Um, but this is the matrix that OFAC utilizes um, to be able to determine where that monetary penalty lies. 
Um, and so certainly something post this guidance, again, we're seven months in post this guidance, um, we should be looking at the ability to be able to not um, sit in box four. You know, box four is that applicable statutory maximum penalty. We don't want to be in box four. So this guidance from OFAC is really going to help support building and enhancing that sanctions compliance program because it's going to happen, right? There's going to be um, something that um, goes through that shouldn't have gone through. You know, a payment is going to go through. It should have been stopped. There was an issue. Perhaps it was a human error. Um, perhaps it was a system issue. Something is going to happen. Um, so having the strength of your sanctions compliance program using the guidance from um, um, <clears throat> OFAC, that's going to be able to help support making sure that you either A, don't get any type of monetary penalty, or if you do, um, that it's the minimum that applies. Um, we put out a couple of examples. I think just very quickly, again, you can have a look at this. Um, when you get the slides as well and dig into them a little bit more. Um, what I try to do, just so you're aware when you're reviewing the slides, in the bolded at the bottom, what I try to do, do was pull out in regards to this fine um, where the violation sat within, um, th within those um, elements that we discussed today. So um, what, what was the... Uh, one issue or the multiple issues that OFAC really called out as aggravating factors. And so I've tried to go through that. I think what's really interesting um, to note here is that while we're seeing a lot of the, um, with a lot of the fines and penalties for those um, that are non-banks that are getting the fines and penalties, well, the, the actual fine or the money, the, um, the actual fine may not be a lot, we're seeing that it's actually equating to the value of the shipment or the value of the payment that was processed. So while the fines may not be a lot, um, they're actually really equal to um, those goods or services that were delivered. And you can certainly see this uh, within the example here um, for that shipping company from New York. Something to communicate and with your management teams, um, making sure it all goes back to that education of your management team. It's not just about the fine. And for anyone on the phone today or listening in today that's been, you know, subject to some sort of um, investigation, uh, law enforcement or otherwise, or some sort of, um, <clears throat> you know, bank regulatory duress, um, and consent orders, we know it's not just the fine. That's the tip of the iceberg, and that's really important to take away for my non-bank people. Make sure you're really delivering the message, you know, hey, they may have only have got fined $20,000, you know, for a $10,000 payment, but now we've opened the door, and now we're going to have to spend all of this time remediating the deficiencies that OFAC identified within our program. Okay, so coming towards the end um, here, um, and actually that's perfect timing because um, just moving towards sort of wrapping up here um, and um, fin finishing, finishing the presentation. Um, so let's um, recap a little bit um, around OFAC's guidance um, and the establishment of this sanctions compliance program. I think a big takeaway is about understanding expectation versus requirement. Um, I would almost go as far to say, you know, we need to live in a world where expectation is the reality on which you will be measured against. Um, you are expected to have an OFAC sanctions compliance program in place, and it needs to be composed of these five pillars. Um, and this starts with that creation of that culture of compliance, right? Um, 
if you don't have this, you're not necessarily going to be, certainly for my non-banks here, you're not necessarily going to, um, <clears throat> you know, be reported on or, or necessarily have an issue identified. What's going to happen is when you do have that failure within one of your sanctions processes and you do process a payment or you onboard someone that you shouldn't have or you enable your third parties and agents to be able to do business in, do business in a sanctioned jurisdiction, that's when it's going to come back um, um, to get you um, later on. So do take this expectation as really that one millimeter behind um, that requirement. And I think I said this a couple of times today already, you know, looking at ways in which you can execute um, appropriately for your organization's size and its complexity. And for certainly for those of you that have, um, you know, multi-jurisdictional um, locations, um, if you're operating, you know, across the globe, 24 hours a day, you're supporting, you know, um, global trade and compliance processes. All of those areas are going to be super risky. You want to be able to appropriately apportion um, resources into those areas of risk. You know, make sure that you're using more automated methods um, in those higher risk areas. Um, and so that you can really balance the program um, appropriately and really utilize that risk-based approach, that unicorn, if you will, of risk-based approach. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. You know, keep it simple and clear. Talk with your peers. Talk um, with your um, friends and pals um, at conferences. You know, take a minute to ask them questions. Um, reach out to your vendors, uh, work with your bank partners. Um, if you are a company that relies um, on a bank to be able to help you process your payments for your operational activity, talk with them. Um, you know, and for banks, reach out to your corporations, to your businesses that you have those relationships with and ensure that they are you know, abiding by or at least establishing tenants of the OFAC compliance, uh, sanctions compliance program. Um, okay, last slide here. 